we don't have time for those 20th century business practices anymore. You know, this little thing over here has has given us the power. The consumer has the power, not the companies anymore. We really require system change, not only from the top-down approach, but the bottom-up approach. So we know that the next generation of uh, employees, managers, executives are going to do it completely different. They're not looking at a nine-to-five sort of mentality of working. They want a more flexible environment. And they want to allow a lot more people to be part of a cooperative business model. So it's not so much competitive anymore. We're in a world that um, we can actually, if we work together, we can solve really wicked problems. And wicked pr- problems, I mean the ones that haven't been solved yet, that are still happening in all of Australia right now. Bushfires are just decimating so many places close to my heart. And, you know, my parents, my brother and my sister are all in three different states with bushfires right around them. The gig economy, the, the, the you know, influx of freelancers is significantly growing so why do you need to be tied down to an organization anymore do you see this as as, as the trend totally and the, and the organization themselves can start to peel away those layers of bureaucracy to be a lot more um, smarter quicker and um, flexible to adapt to the technological changes i mean you can't see four to five billion dollar companies like Commonwealth Bank or or Telstra or Optus um, being able to react to market changes as quick because they've just got 100,000 people working for them. What would you say is great leadership in the modern era? Um... No leadership. <laughs> really? Uh, no, I, I think there, there needs to be significant, but it's authentic leadership. Mm. You know, it's... So I talked a lot about learning by doing. What about leading by doing? Mm-hmm. You know, I've always been managing staff, leading staff, but also getting in there and doing the work. You know, getting in there and talking to the customers getting in there and understanding how we can do things better. So I think this authentic leadership needs a lot more, um, you know, fingers in the pie or more, you know, more get your hands dirty because when they're, you know, going out, you know, going out to long lunches or things like that, you know, it's a, it's, it's, it's this, again, this false... Um, sense of the way business is done these days um, we don't have time for those 20th century business practices anymore you know this little thing over here has has given us the power the consumer has a power not the companies anymore we had the Melbourne Cup how, how much would we invest on a single day in that stupid horse race five billion dollars something ludicrous so australians have a propensity of um short-term risk they really you know don't have an issue with putting money down the drain but when they're actually wanting to invest in the future and longer term risk such as new technologies such as early stage ventures such as innovations that are coming out of research institutions. They don't do it. They don't do it because we're still rewarded on that quarterly business cycle that is complete fabrication. It doesn't show us that companies are growing quarter on quarter 
because we don't have that long-term vision. Yeah, that's interesting. And I think that's ingrained in organizations in most cases because CEOs, they have a certain term. They just want to look good on that term and then they go out and it's the next person's job. Mm. And also, you mentioned something quite interesting because I've heard of this saying that Australia is quite a good test market for Europe and the US. So most people would try to launch here and then bring it overseas. But you're saying we're actually quite different. Yeah, look, I, I think it's we are a good test market. Um, we do adopt technology quite quickly for a country also if your product or service fails here no one hears about it you know which is not not a, at all you know disrespectful to australia but you know you know if 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 a samsung phone blows up in the middle of times square it's a bit different to if it blows up in the middle of adelaide and Adelaide is actually a really good test market for new technologies down there because they have a cross-section of, you know, potential users. And also, yeah, if it, if it happens in Adelaide, it's, it may not be, you know, in, in the Wall Street Journal tomorrow morning. Okay. I think accountability is key for progress. So, but it's, it's what type of accountability he's striving for. He's striving for intrinsic motivators, extrinsic motivators, or another one that I've found in the sweet spot is task motivators. Age old checklist, going to a supermarket. Yep, I've checked out off all my items. I've done a good job, you know? So the idea is that instead of looking at a sporting team and going, we're gonna either win or lose, but look at a roadmap and we know what our vision is, but we don't want to give it to people to say, all right, you need to complete the next 150 steps to get to our vision. But if you say to someone, do the next three steps, and then we will then reward you for that to keep going. Then we'll do the next three steps, reward you. And this could be, in an early stage venture, we talk about the Lean Startup, and it was um, written by Eric Rees, okay? He called it a metered funding system. So like a parking meter, you spend a month doing a project, you tell the sponsor, this could be an internal um, boss, it could be your investor, um, what you've learned out of that process and what you're going to do for the next milestone, then they'll give you another um, pot of money, okay, to spend for that next quarter, whatever it is. So it's called a metered funding system because it's like putting, keep putting money in the meter so you don't get a parking ticket. So what we um, eventually um, do is mitigate that risk management process because we're not funding a project in its entirety. We're funding a project in um, actionable um, milestones, okay, to limit our exposure, okay, and allow us to iterate the product based on the feedback we receive. And if we can do that effectively, we're going to have a much more desirable um, solution that people should invest in. What are your top three favorite books? Um, Huckleberry Finn. Okay. Okay. You know, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain is, is such a, um, it's a book that allowed a little boy to be curious. Okay. And I've always been curious. Animal Liberation, okay, was a book that allowed me to understand the inequitable state we provide our animals, okay, so so now I lead a, a life of, you know, vegetarianism, you know, and, you know, I try to limit um, killing anything and try to take that spider or that cockroach or that ant outside 
Um, third book, I'd say Way All Done. It's a, it's a really small book, but it's Way All Done by Ken Blanchard. And it talks about accentuating the positive. Okay. Okay. So it's all about, you know, we all have a lot of stuff going on in our, in our life. You know, we have all these obstacles to overcome. But if we can always take it a positive outlook to it, we can achieve anything. When it, when it comes to the gig economy and, and protecting yourself for the future with superannuation and, and savings and things like that, there is a real time value of money question there because if you can actually um, be successful now, then you can build up your savings or if you invest in property or or other emerging schemes. Um, I, th- I think that's better than forcing people into a planned savings retirement. I'm fortunate, and I think a lot of entrepreneurs are going to be fortunate because the average age of an entrepreneur in Australia is about 37, okay? So they traditionally have had a corporate experience and they've built up a significant um, investment for their future that they can't unlock till they're 65. So that gives them also another um, safety net um, to go out on their own and try something new. So I think it just comes down to simple managing your money. If, If, you know, if, if you've got a good accountant, a good lawyer, you know, and a good advisor, whether they be a mentor or, or a father or an uncle or, you know, a mother, who, whoever can actually um, give you that good practical advice, then we'll be fine. Yeah, I guess financial education and literacy would have to evolve with the times as well. I don't think you'd go out and be a freelancer if you didn't have the confidence or the ability um, to actually do it yourself. So they would quickly move back into an employee environment and get their you know, benefits. You just lack the rest, the autonomy, the freedom, the space to innovate. I guess it draws different personality types. So entrepreneurships and um, the safe corporate job. Yeah, yeah, certainly. From an early age, we um, force our you know children, our our students to um, into a specific um, genre or discipline. You know, we tell them pretty quickly if they're not good at drawing or they're great at maths. And that actually influences, influences them to limit their decision-making and go into a, a narrow future. And I think that's the last thing that we should do. Some parents have this mindset, though, that they want their kid to focus on something from a very early age, and by the time they're teenagers, they're just experts already. So that's a very different way of thinking as well. Yeah, it's in, it's actually interesting. I didn't didn't think about that uh, before because when I speak to early stage companies, I want them to focus. Okay, they can't be everything to anyone because they don't have the resources available for them. So they need to pick their ideal customer profile, their specific target market, and just see if they can get traction okay um so that is definitely a laser focus um i'm just yeah i'm just unsure if that should be within our education system Mm. because we're taking we're taking the focus away from um a specific discipline to a more rounded individual Mm. so we need someone not only with the core capabilities, whether it be that 
the 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 math based or the arts based or the science based or the business based disciplines okay but you need the overarching skills in communication and collaboration and teamwork and problem solving and you know emotional intelligence and all, all those intelligences that allows that critical thinking and ability to not just do what's been asked of you probably what makes humans humans yeah and you know computers have got a long way to go until they're going to make us obsolete you two were uh flying on to auckland after after australia and they were sick of uh, they were sick of traveling in the same plane as their crew because they chartered a full 747 oh. um with you know obviously all their equipment in 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 in, in the freight you know belly and their crew upstairs and and they asked for a separate jet just for the band to travel from Sydney to Auckland and um, that was going to be about um, fifty thousand dollars I think it was around that I can't remember but you know we had to give them the proposition to say Okay, if you want to, you know, um, buy another jet, it's going to be that. And uh, at the time, the band, and much respect to them, said, oh, that's too expensive. Because a corporate jet in Australia is very different to a corporate jet in Europe or the States because we just don't have enough of them. Okay, so typical supply and demand makes ours a lot more expensive and uh, Bono actually owned half a corporate jet in Ireland so he knew exactly how much jets normally would be to hire and he just thought it was um, you know we were ripping them off so they said no and they kept on the 747 with the rest of the band so I was happy with that. Do you have any crazy stories in terms of like presentations to like bands or sporting teams as well? Um, oh, look, yes, but I don't think I can okay. say any of them. No worries. That's I'll, right. I'll, I'll, have, I'll have to write a book uh, just before I uh, die. <laughs> just to let out all the secrets into the world. Pretty much. I think that'll be fun. It's an interesting life. Yeah, it's great. Thanks for watching this episode of The Convoy Couch. And thank you to Stephen for coming on today. Thank you. Don't forget to check out the links below to the Scale Institute and subscribe too.